Dennis. My name is Dr. Dennis. Welcome to our event tonight. Before we get started, I wanted you guys just to watch this video real fast. It's very short, and then we'll start our program, okay? I just wanted to let you know that me and my honey tested positive for COVID-19 yesterday. This place yeah. is shit. They have us in nasty ass rooms. Um, they have no cleaning supplies or electricity. We're in a room with other girls from different yards and units because they say they have no space to put everyone at, which is a uh, video. Places. I have never been scared to death like this except for the day of my crime. My friend, can you help us please call up here and demand for them to put us where all of electricity. Okay, let me start this over. Sorry, I just guys. wanted to let you know okay. that me and my honey tested positive for COVID 19 yeah. yesterday. This place isn't shit. They have us in nasty ass rooms. Um, they have no cleaning supplies or electricity. We're in a room with other girls from different yards and units because they say they have no space to put everyone at, which is uh, simply ridiculous. I have never been scared to death like this except for the day of my crime. My friend, can you help us please call up here and demand for them to put us where all of electricity and be in a safe and clean environment because we don't have chemicals that are strong enough to clean away the germs. Friend, uh, trip out. As saying in general population have heat, electricity and chemicals tables and a chair, but the ones that get infected with the COVID get treated like we are dogs, animals with rabies. Please call up someone and demand that they give us the things we need to survive this COVID, please. Uh, okay, thank you. Welcome to our event. Um, what you just saw was a little snapshot of a larger dialogue that is gonna to happen tonight. So tonight you're going to hear from four women in this webinar who are going to share their experiences um, behind bars. Once again, my name is Dr. Dennis. Welcome to our event. And let I me just want to let you know that me and my honey tested positive. Okay, uh, first and foremost, I would like to read our land acknowledgement. It is with great respect that Cal State LA acknowledges the Tongva people as the traditional caretakers of Tongvan Gar, the Tongva world, including the Los Angeles Basin, South Channel Islands, San Gabriel, and Pomona Valleys, and portions of Orange, San Bernardino, and Riverside counties. Cal State LA is located within these lands, and as an institution located on unceded Tongva land, we pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and our re relatives' relations past, present, and emerging. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have the responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold Cal State LA more accountable to the needs of American Indian peoples. With that said, I would like to welcome you to our program. Um, this program is part of a larger project, the Mervyn Dimely Archives Project, and the public programming in, is in collaboration with our partners, the Education Department at the Autry Museum, Project Rebound at Cal State LA, and the Los Angeles Regional Reentry Partnership. And this was also made possible from support from California Humanities, a nonprofit partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. This event is part of a series with Cal State LA Li University Library that does focus on the incredible work of nurses and other healthcare workers. So welcome to our event. Thank you so much for attending. Um, I would like to introduce to you a couple speakers that you will be hearing uh, from in a couple minutes. Robert and Summer from Cal State LA Project Rebound and then Troy Vaughn, the ex executive director from the Los Angeles Regional Reentry Partnership. So again, we welcome you to this space. We look forward, <clears throat> excuse me, to having and hearing an impactful dialogue from our four leaders. Robert, I turn this over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Dennis. <clears throat> Thank you everyone for being here. My name is Robert Ortiz Archila. My gender pronouns are he, him, el. I am a formerly incarcerated individual um, and drawing from the many barriers that formerly incarcerated students 
uh, face in higher education, I would like to uh, quickly tell you a little bit about my story. I served in the Army. I served with the 82nd Airborne Division as a paratrooper. I've been deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, it wasn't until my last deployment that I was wounded in combat. I was given a Purple Heart and sent home without no plan. I quickly lost myself, wrapped up in addiction, experienced homelessness, and was incarcerated numerous times. Uh, this lufa of arrest uh, amounted, and I was designated a uh, habitual offender. So I was locked up. My last prison sentence was a three-year prison sentence that when I got out, I decided to feel good about myself again. So I checked into rehab at the VA hospital and I enrolled in a community college. I went from being a homeless person and I graduated summa cum laude from an aerospace program. I transferred to the Cal State system, earned a bachelor's degree in liberal studies. And currently I'm a graduate student in pursuit of a counseling degree. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, return on the investment in the formerly incarcerated. I am a walking example of that. And, it, and it's because of you all, my community, that I feel empowered, supported, and embraced. So that's my story. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to Summer. Thanks, Robert. Um, I love listening to Robert's story. Um, it reminds me of the reason why I stick around and, and do the work that I do at Project Rebound. Um, so I'm Summer Brantner. I too am formerly incarcerated, um, one student, now a uh, staff at Cal State LA. Um, I was hired at Cal State LA about three years ago after being a participant, um, a member of Project Rebound Cal State LA. I did my undergrad and my graduate there. Um, I was a party girl, got into some trouble um, drinking and driving. Uh, in fact, I think I, I, I didn't think I was incarcerated enough, really, um, when I first was asked to um, you know, fill into uh, Project Rebound uh, program coordinator. I wasn't sure if I was the one, right? Um, which is kind of an ironic thing. But I wanted to share something with you that kind of relates um, to the, the COVID topic that we have here. And so it's kind of been a barrier, but it's something specific to women. Um, so my experience, um, I served two weeks at county jail um, and that was my second time, um, and it's my last time. Uh, and I had just, uh, both times I got arrested for drinking and driving, I was in postpartum. Um, I think both of my kids at, at that time were four months old and I, and I got into trouble then and I was depressed. Um, and so I went to the bottle um, to solve it. It didn't solve it, it made things more complicated. However, um, the second time around I was nursing my son um, and I remember I was in school and you know, cause I've been struggling going back and forth, right? And you know, I'd be okay and then, then I'd get into some trouble again. And so <laughs> I was, um, attending school and I wanted the judge to please just let me finish out the semester. I was nursing my son. I wanted to let him get, you know, weaned and then, you know, I'll finish the semester and I'll turn myself in for the summer and they weren't having it. So I had to go in and I, and I promised myself and my son, who's, you know, not going to understand it for months, right? Um, that, you know, I need to, to be able to keep, excuse my, you know, if anybody's offended, you shouldn't be, but I had to keep them working, right? So I um, was given a breast pump. I, I immediately saw my white privilege. I'm gonna put that out there right away. So my experience is probably different than some of the other experiences you'll hear here. Um, in fact, it was, it was shocking and it was really disconcerting. Um, I had guards checking on me to see if I was okay, that, things like that. Um, but it doesn't take away from the pain of um, being away from my son and being, having that separation. And I don't think sometimes we realize or um, understand just maybe the general population out there that separating um, a mother and their son um, is, is hugely detrimental, not only to the mother, but to the child, right? So this becomes, you know, something that, that I've passed on to him. And I'll never forget, um, you know, I would use the breast pump and, you know, I kept them working and then I was so proud of myself when I got out. I was like, "Yay, I get to you know be with my son again." But when I when I was reunited with him, you know, he started freaking out. Um, he didn't he, he didn't know who I was. He couldn't smell me anymore. Um, and, and I'll never forget like how heart wrenching and gut wrenching that was. Um, and it wasn't until I you know took a shower and cleaned up, and then I came and sat down with him. I would end up being on house arrest for another forty five days that, you know, he calmed down and, and, but I just remember the look in his eyes. It was just this, this, he was so confused and he didn't have any language or any way to express himself. And I just wanted to share that because that's my experience. Um, and it was short, um, thank God, but it was, it was traumatic enough. I, I, I hold back the tears right now because I don't like to think about it. Um, and I know that it still affects him to this day. Um, 
And I think that um, it's important for people to hear that. But um, we're doing good now, <laughs> so that's okay. And I'm happy to be here today with Dr. Dennis and all these wonderful people. And um, I, I look forward to hearing um, the dialogue with the ladies today. Thank you. Thank you, Summer, for that. And I appreciate your support with this grant and, and just the work that you do that's so important right now. Um, I wanted to introduce two women that are on the team um, that are on my team, our grant team. One is a, the archivist uh, for special collections at the Cal State University Library. It's Azalea Camacho. And I also have our social science librarian, Kendall Faulkner, with us tonight, too. And we worked as a team for the last year on this Mervyn Dimely exhibit. So this program that we put together tonight uh, really came from the letters that were written to Mervyn Dimely from incarcerated men in the 1970s. And we thought it would be nice to obviously focus on, on women that are incarcerated. And we wanted to collaborate with LARP on this. Um, so tonight we're gonna hear the women's side uh, and, and their experiences of, of what it means to be behind bars and everything. But I just wanted to acknowledge publicly Kendall and Azalea for their hard work and, and their support with this as well. I would like to now introduce to you our um, guest speaker, who is the executive director of the Los Angeles Regional Reentry Partnership, Troy Vaughn. Thank you so much for joining us tonight in this dialogue. Thank you, um, Dr. Dennis and um, all of our other speakers that just went before me. I just, um, you know, I give honor. I just wanted to give pause because um, this is my first Mother's Day. I'll be celebrating without my mom. And I don't know what I would have done without um, a mother nurturing um, me in this space and her love, even though I had to go through incarceration and a life and bringing me back from that without a mother's love, it was important. So women are so important um, to what we do um, in this work. And I think oftentimes it's under underlooked. A little bit about um, you know myself, I'm formerly incarcerated. And, you know, my life is, you know, a life of similar to what Robert spoke and Summer already spoke. We all have a story and a testimony of what God has done in our lives and being a, a Marine coming out and ending up homeless and um, addicted and, uh, and living a life of homelessness is, and being criminalized for being in that situation. Ultimately, I ended up in incarceration, um, got out. Um, was able to meet some wonderful people after seven years of living a life on the street, um, made a covenant with God in my life um, that if he would save me and deliver me, I would serve him for the rest of my life. And um, basically for the last 30 years, that's what I've been doing, devoting my life. I um, went to um, Trey Tech, um, matriculated from Trey Tech, went over to Cal State LA, um, continued my education, ultimately ended up with um, my doctorate in theology and my Juris Doctor degree. Um, about 10 years ago, I started LARP, this organization, um, and um, with some colleagues in mind at the time, we had about 20 of us, just had a heart. I was the executive vice president at Weingart, and I um, met some good people, and we put our hearts together, we wanted to just have an impact with Assembly Bill 109. Um, we ultimately ended up um, doing a lot more than that, um, getting inclusion into the budget, creating a voice for people that have been system impacted. We realized that it was a need to have our voices at the table and to create capacity for ourselves and not let anybody else speak for us. Um, and so that's what we did. Fast forward, we have over 850 network organizations, a public and private partnership that's creating system change both here locally in Los Angeles. Um, and also across the state. We operate through um, several working issue committees, um, including housing, employment, education, policy and legal, integrated health, um, convening, faith-based. Um, we have regional committees that help us to um, bridge the gap regionally um, so that we can all be aligned. Um, and then recently, we just started our Leaders Academy led by our very own Anthony Garcia. Um, and the reason why we started Leaders Academy is really because of what we, um, you know, we thought and believe in our heart is that the voices of system impacted individuals um, are needed in this space. Oftentimes, those with um, the, the solutions 
um, are the ones that are mostly impacted, but they're furthest from the power and the resources. And so LARP exists to be that bridge to connect people um, that have solutions, that have, have been impacted by the system to really begin to create the change that we all seek. And so what we do is we put them at the table. We create a, an opportunity for their voices to be not only heard, but coalesced um, so that we can begin to address a lot of the ills um, that they are facing, none more so than women. Um, one of the things that we have realized, and I'm so proud of Jenea and Chi Chi and Laura and Cynthia, Cynthia tonight, um, and just can't wait to hear them speak with the power and the passion and the experience um, that they have. Um, but one of the things that we've known, and, and, and we know that data shows us since 1980, that um, women in prison has risen over 750%. Um, and we are talking about people being placed in a system that was designed for men. And so we don't have a system here that really understands women and the needs of women in the carceral system. And I think you're gonna hear some of that. Women um, are nurturers by nature um, and so, and communicators by nature. And so the system itself is not designed to foster that. I think you because women, you know, me being raised by women, I understand the importance of relationships because of my mom and my grandmother and my sisters. And I think for women, relationship is central to their being. They are they're born to be nurturers, right? And so what we need to understand is that the self-worth of a woman um, and their actions um, are really derived from that core need to be a nurturer and to be into relationship. And so we believe in LARP that we want to create capacity and change within the systems because we don't want to have our mothers and our sisters and our aunts and our grandmothers incarcerated and to continue to perpetuate the psychological problems and traumas that will bleed down into generations because we're disconnecting our nurturers from um, their natural purpose. And so we, we want to make sure that we're restoring that. And so we need the voices. I mean, just alone here in California, we have that data that shows that the very need for a woman to speak is viewed as disrespectful um, because what we have is women being placed in and carceral systems that were meant for men and the staff that are now have been, you know, staffing those institutions have not been overturned. And so they're approaching it from a punitive standpoint and not having a real practical understanding of the need of a mother um, to communicate, a need of a mother to understand that she's connected to her children while she's serving time oftentimes for crimes that have been done against them, right? Many women suffer from abuse. Um, they're born into abusive relationships and, and situations. And so it's because of these violations um, that have been perpetuated on our women in our communities, especially women of color, um, that we continue to see what's happening. And so we have a disconnect in our system. And so one of the things that LARP is, um, moving toward doing is creating community-based restoration, right? Like we believe that we don't need more prisons, we need more services. We need services that are unique to understanding the needs of women. Um, and we wanna address those needs prior to people coming into contact with law enforcement, quite frankly. We wanna make sure that they don't have a need to actually go into the system. If we create more community capacity within our communities, then there will be no need really to to have in contact with law enforcement at all. But if there is contact with law enforcement, there's no need to really go into a cage. Um, we can actually rehabilitate ourselves within community. There's models across the, not just the nation, but across the world that show that if we do community-based restorative housing models in community, instead of building jails, that we have greater outcome and a greater impact on recidivism. And so one of the things that we're going to be doing, and you'll hear from some of our leaders um, today, is really elevating their voice and giving rise to really creating opportunities and pathways for system change. And so we want to get the power of the network behind what they're going to raise up and really 
be, begin to create the change that we all see. So I'm really excited to be in this space tonight um, to really hear from them. I mean, you know, I can go on and speak as a pastor. I don't, I don't have a problem speaking, um, but I'm here to hear from our leaders. I want to hear from what they have to say and then create the dialogue and be engaged in that dialogue with you guys on tonight. But again, thank you so much um, for allowing um, me to be in this space, but more importantly, our leaders and their voices to be raised in this space. Um, we are excited to hear from them and see um, what we're gonna have tonight. So thank you so much um, for uh, giving them this platform. And, and Dr. Dennis, I turn it back over to you. Thank you, um, Troy. We appreciate your ability to come speak to us and, and really center um, this entire dialogue on women's experience. Um, before we hear from the ladies, I would like to introduce very quickly and acknowledge and honor um, Anthony Garcia, who is the Leaders um, Program Director for LARP. Uh, Anthony, real fast. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, and thank you very much for attending everybody that's here. Thank you very much for putting this together, Cal State LA. Thank you very much team, LARP team and LARP family for assisting and the leaders for uh, participating in this event. I appreciate everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony Garcia. I'm the program coordinator at Los Angeles Regional Reentry Partnership, and um, I will be uh, passing it on to our leaders, our four strong women leaders who participated in this cohort that were that they're in, um, and they will be then speaking um, next uh, with the help of Summer. Um, so therefore, take it on, Summer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Summer. Um, before we begin, again, um, I just want to thank the panelists, and I would really like to thank Anaya Richardson, Chichi Lochi, Cynthia Blake, and um, Laura Hernandez for sharing your experiences tonight. So we are so grateful that you agreed to share space with us. Summer, please, let's start this dialogue. You're muted, but that's okay. I'm muted. Just kidding. I know. It's like <laughs> Zoom right now. For reals. Thank you, Dr. Dennis. I appreciate it. Um, and um, thank you, panelists, for being here. I know I know some of you, and I'm meeting some of you for the first time, so welcome. Um, I guess we could start with um, a question that I, I think is really a great question. Um, what kind of child were you? Um, I figured we could start there. Um, maybe Laura Hernandez, if you would like to um, take us forth. Hi, sure. Thank you all for being here and for opening up this space for this conversation, um, for the invite. When I first got it, I was like, wow, you know, people are taking notice of women and what they bring to the table and it was awesome. So thank you for that. Um, what kind of child was I? You know, I was a good kid. You know, I went to school, I got good grades. Um, I did the best that I could in the situation that I was in, you know, I um, grew up in a very abusive home. Um, there was a lot of trauma from a very early age. Um, I experienced so many different things as a young child, like things that nobody should go through. Um, but despite all of that, I maintained my joy. I think some kind of way in the in the mess of it all. I was able to just maintain that that joy that children have right it's incredible how children are so resilient despite the fact that they endure um, countless harms against them and um, disparities and discriminations you know uh, a lot of us i know grew up in homes where children are to be seen and not heard and so despite all of that i feel like i was a really really good kid i applied myself in school i made sure that um i expanded my horizon my own little horizons you know by like going to different extracurricular activities like sports and choir and band and I participated in plays. I was I was in everything and anything you can think of and I loved it. And when I was doing it as a kid, I didn't know what was happening, right? I thought I was just having fun at school and and you know participating in programs. It wasn't until later on in life that I realized um, you know that school was my escape. It was the place that I couldn't wait to go every day because it was away from the chaos 
and the trauma that was my home. Uh, it was an experience that um, I think about now and I, I tell myself like, and I, or I see other small children and I'm like, gosh, you know, it's it's so blissful to be that young and innocent and, and not really realize the stuff that's going on. You don't even realize you're being traumatized in the middle of it. You know, we're getting, um, and and uh, uh, disciplined right and you don't even realize that there's anything wrong I didn't even realize that you know when I was being uh, sexually assaulted as a child that there was anything wrong with that you know I thought I didn't know that my neighbor wasn't experiencing the same thing I didn't know until later on in school people started talking about how this isn't right and I was like well, it's not like I didn't know so um I was that kid, you know, that kid that had all that stuff going on underneath the waterline and you couldn't tell, nobody could tell. You know, I'm listening to you speak and I, we have so much in common. Like I, I could, that could have been me speaking right now, I have to say, um, thank you for that. And I don't know if anybody else would like to um, speak to that, but I, I just think that that's, um, feel free to jump in anytime you guys want. Okay, uh, ladies, um, this is gonna be a dialogue. So uh, if you have something that, your heart wants to um, to share, then please do that. Um, Laura, so, thank yeah. you for speaking on, on that. That's an impactful issue, especially trauma. As a historian, we don't address trauma enough. And, and I'm grateful that she even spoke on that. I wanted to keep our dialogue moving. So ladies, if you do want to speak on um, your, you know, your, your life as a, as a small child, if there was any issues, again, that um, resonated with you. I wanted to reach out to um, Cynthia Blake, a, a question that was submitted. Um, you know, what part of your life's journey do you think was most challenging? And as Laura said, you know, growing up in, in that environment was extremely challenging and harmful. So Cynthia, what can you share with us? So oh, if, if uh, we're looking at it on that aspect was when I was asked, when I presented the question, it was more later on in life, but if I was gonna look at it from my childhood perspective, then it was definitely the, um, the drugs and the abuse in the home. Um, you know, there was drug, lots of drugs. There was um, lots of alcohol and a lot, a lot of domestic abuse. We've seen, it, it was really bad, you know, to the point where I'm 52 years old and I'm still in therapy. Like it was really bad. That's what dictated my life. And I was a good kid. You know, I was a good kid. I went to school. Um, but because I was so withdrawn um, because of what was going on in the house, I didn't fit in with the other kids at school. So then I started getting bullied. I started lying a lot. I was having really bad nightmares. There was a lot of things that should have been red flags to my parents. Like, you know, she needs help, you know, something's going on. I started self-harming by the time I was, um, I was around 10, I was like, just self-harming really bad. Um, like I said, um, I was drinking, I started drinking probably around, we were still my mom's beer. We were like five, six, but then I was full on drug addict by the time I was like 15, um, pregnant when I was 16. And yeah, that was my life. Got involved in with a gang um, around 15 years old. Uh, like, and it all had to do with the domestic violence in the home. It was really, really bad. It wasn't this slap here and this. You, you know, what I'm saying that to me. Yeah, that's domestic violence, and it shouldn't happen. But I'm talking about we've seen things that as children we shouldn't have. Like, it shouldn't have happened. And I'm. Um, I'm very um, um, pro keep your hands to yourself <laughs> because it affects your children really bad. Absolutely, I agree, yeah. I agree. Um, does anybody want to speak to that? Um, I think that I relate to a lot to your story as well. I think I have a feeling I'm gonna to relate to a lot of y'all's stories here. Um, so I'm wondering if um, another question that was submitted, if we could maybe move to that, because I like the direction that it's going and we can kind of go like through the life, you know, the life. Uh, maybe um, uh, if we could speak to nav navigating the prison landscape, right? And does right. anybody want to speak to that? What that was like? Because I don't want to spend too much time there um, um, unless somebody wants to. Um, but can you um, elaborate that question a little so, bit? Um, navigating the prison, like once you were in prison, so. How did you all navigate that? I, I think Laura submitted this question. If Laura, if you wanted to speak to that, you could. 
we can hear from Ganea too, and then Chi Chi. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have other questions. So, um, navigating the prison system, I guess, when I posed that question was um, just to kind of share like what it was like, you know, it was my first time in prison and it was a whole new world and I knew nothing of how I was supposed to act or behave or talk or walk or, you know, you see all the movies, you hear from other people. Uh, the other people I knew were men, you know, and, and the men's prisons are very different than female prisons. So I had this perspective of prison and then I get there and it's very different and there's so many other um, aspects and pieces and parts to it that are specific to women that nobody prepares you for, right? And um, it, it was a challenge, you know? And I think um, in the very beginning when I first got there, it was, um, it was confusing, I guess is the only word I can think of. It was very confusing. I didn't know uh, which way to go or what to do. And so, you know, my first year and a half in prison was all over, I was all over the place. I mean, I wasn't doing anything I was supposed to be doing as a new lifer going into uh, a prison system. You know, instead of preparing myself to get out of there, I was doing everything else. You know, I didn't take groups. I didn't do anything until a couple years in when I just, it's something just hit me. And I just said, you know what? I have this L on the back of my sentence that says, you know, that I'm gonna die in here. And um, I just don't wanna believe that for myself. And so I said, I need to figure out how I ended up a 21 year old in prison with a life sentence and how to prevent it from, you know, happening again when I got out because I knew that I was going to get out. Um, I was determined. And so <clears throat> there was a lot of navigation to have to happen in there. You know, um, you had to navigate relationships with um, hundreds of other women that you nor normally wouldn't normally deal with. You have to navigate relationships with correctional staff, with free staff, with the doctors. The medical system in prison is um, under par, to say the least. And so that was a challenge, especially uh, someone like me. I experienced um, some female uh, issues, medical issues that were pretty severe, and it was very difficult to navigate that. Um, I ended up on a bus trip from Chowchilla to CIW within 30 days because of my medical condition and their lack of treatment. So, um, yeah, it was really challenging to navigate that space. And, um, but you know what? It made me stronger. It made me the woman that I am today. After I started taking self-help and I started to work on myself and to work on the, those deep seated thoughts and the feelings that I had about who I was as a woman um, and started to see myself, you know, as a, a righteous child of God and um, to understand my position on this planet, I, I, I got stronger, you know, and I was able to navigate that. And it, although it was challenging, I feel like it was worth it. And, and I ended up on top. Awesome. I think that's yeah. great. I believe you. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to um, continue with this dialogue about just that transformation from moving from uh, incarceration to coming home, <clears throat> excuse me. And I wanted to ask Chi Chi, um, she had submitted a question, how has your experience been since coming home? What can you tell or, or even advice wise give to um, you know those that are, are just coming home for the first time? Share your experience, please. Thank you. You're on mute though, I can't hear you. <clears throat> Can you hear me now? Yeah, and turn it up a little bit more. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So several things went through my head when posing that question. I felt as though I was dumped into a situation where it was going to be a challenge from the start. After spending two decades inside, um, coming out here during the time of COVID, the plan that they had for me for the last 13 years changed instantaneously while my daughter was bringing me home from CIW. And I ended up at the wine guard versus crossroads. So I knew that I had to make my covenant with God uh, solid. 
because I made some promises that I needed to keep. And I've always been adaptable. So going into the wine guard, I had to see the pros and cons and how it was going to benefit me with no movement, without the opportunity of reuniting with my family in the capacity that I wanted to. And I too started to learn the system there because I had learned the system at Chowchilla as well as CIW. So now I'm supposed to be free and I'm incarcerated again. And my, my life depended on people's lives that were around me. So coming home to a family that I wasn't reunited with or the opportunities that were deemed to be mine when I stepped out of uh, prison, such as being a facilitator for the FI or working um, as an entrepreneur of owning my own company, I ended up on Skid Row and I found out that I could go to school. So I got a laptop, I started contacting people like LARP, ARC, the reentry program and that support team has helped me navigate my being home. I came home July 22nd. In the end, <laughs> it's crazy. During such time, I have survived COVID. I have survived death because I almost died. How many weeks ago? Three weeks ago? Three weeks ago. I have worked as a, a disabled service worker working with the homeless directly. However, all of those experiences have made me so humble and compassionate and having an understanding that I don't truly understand. So I know that whatever God's path is for my life, I am free. Even when my body was somewhere it was, I didn't feel that it, it deserved to be, I learned how to be free within that situation in that system. And so for those who are coming home and have expectations, I would say, look within yourself, find out where you want to go because you know where you've been and use those things that you've learned during those times to be in a position of con continuously excelling. And that's what I've been doing. I have continuously excelled since that short period of time against all odds. And I know that it was something greater than myself. Thank you, Chi Chi, for that. Thank you so much for that. I, I wanted to um, continue with this opening dialogue and, and move to Ghanaia, if you will. Um, you had submitted a couple of questions that I thought were excellent. And I just wanted you to, again, pick up on what Chi Chi said about some of the things that you had to navigate while you were inside and, and how did you make that transition um, and, and, you know, into our LARP leadership program as well. First off, thank you for having me here. I really appreciate this. And I appreciate the dialogue that we're creating. Um, I like the order of the questions because we started off with the childhood and then we talked about prison and now we're talking about <coughs> the entry. That is very important because the childhoods that we have kept us in a perpetual state of trauma. And now we're stuck in a perpetual state of trauma and they have incarcerated us with nothing but trauma around us. So being a woman, like um, Troy Vine said in the beginning, you know, it, it's not an environment that cultivates the best of a woman. It's actually an environment that cultivates the darkest parts of your souls because everybody's broken, everybody's lost, and everybody's trying to find a way out everybody's trying to understand and so if only through the grace of God um, because he is that light that is inside of us and without that light I would have been utterly lost because I didn't start my path on the right foot I didn't start my path like like Laura was saying who can understand how to to live in an environment like that where nobody where it's nothing but brokenness to hurt the guards is trained to treat you a certain type of way the medical is substandard like she was saying like who 
can have tools to navigate in an environment like that, especially being a woman who is a natural caregiver, who is the giver of life, who holds life within her. You know, society is not cultivating our women the way that they should be in order for these jewels and treasures to come out of us. Like we are the leaders. And so to have to be in an environment like that, it was very hard. And if it was only through the grace of God that he showed in me that I had humanity in me, that I had kindness that that when I inclined my ear to a woman who had tears in her eyes and we connected through that pain we connected through that 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 being there for each other that's what helped me to survive in that type of place because I saw that I was able to be that small light to other women by doing a simple act it's, it's, it's just something as simple as seeing them, hearing them, being present with them. We're cramped into one room, eight women to one room. For number one, that's not healthy. I, I'm, all these people are strangers around me. Everybody's broken. We've been discarded at our lowest points in society, and, and, and we're supposed to thrive in this. You know, I, I've been saying recently that, you know, they did a study of um, solitary confinement and the effects that it has on the mind, the body, the spirit. But it must be also just being incarcerated as a human being, as a woman, it has to have some type of adverse effect because in my reentry, I'm starting to see this. I'm starting to see the effects of incarceration being locked in a small cell for 18 years, not being exposed to experience. So I cannot understand or begin to fathom what I'm meant to be or to do because experience is what ignites us. So we have little to no experience locked in this box. And I, I don't want to continue to go on. You know, we, we're surrounded by violence, but I'm just glad that we're having this conversation because we need to be putting this out there. People need to be inclining their ear to this type of, listen to the hearts of the women, the plight of the women. We need to be doing this. So I thank you guys for this. Um, as far as me coming home, so coming from, because I was trying to set the stage, so coming from that childhood, coming from that incarceration, and yes, it does help make you stronger, but it's only through the grace of glory of God and through women like Laura, Chi Chi, Cynthia, who have held my hand through the process because I couldn't have done it alone. If it wasn't for the woman on the next bunk next to me daring to say, hey girl, what's wrong with you today? Then I wouldn't be sitting where I am today. I would still be in a state of utter despair. So I thank these ladies because these ladies have walked with me, you know, uh, Chi Chi, I know Chi Chi personally, but although I may not know Cynthia personally, you know, I know a lot of Cynthia's. I, I know that's the face of the ladies who was in there with me. So, um, so today in my reentry, I'm learning that people out here want to help us. But how can they help us? Because a lot of, I'm learning that a lot of people don't have our best interests at heart. And I'm not talking about LARP. LARP has been amazing. But as a woman coming out vulnerable into society, we need to be creating safe spaces for women. We need to be creating safe spaces and we need to be cultivating the best part of our soul for these women. And that's, I, I don't feel like that's happening enough because we're coming home. We want to work. We want to do this. We want to do that, but we want to live. We want to live. So we get caught, caught up in, in, and I have to work. I have to make a life for myself. I have to do this because I'm behind all these years because a woman at 39, my age has had X, Y, and Z, but I've been in a box for so long. So I'm trying to compensate by do everything, but I'm forgetting to live in the process. So my living is being exposed to experiences that bring me joy, experience that's going to cultivate the artistic part of me, the creative part of me, the loving part of me. So, you know, and so, and, and I'm going and I'm, I'm doing all this re-entry research, research, experiencing this, going here, going that, but I see that a lot of it is not about, they forget about the living part and, and we want to live. So that's, that's how we become our best selves, by having a balance of work and a balance of life that is living, that is igniting us, that is inspiring us to be our best selves. So I don't know if I answered your question, but that's how that's been my experience since I've been home. That's a transition. I did have a little fallback because I was taking on so many things that I, I wasn't 
caring for self because we want to help everybody when we come home. Yeah, make amends. Yeah, we're making amends, but our whole life doesn't have to be about that. And this is what people are, I think that's where the misconception comes on. We're making amends by being our better selves, but I don't have to feel like I need to help this and that and that and that and that because I have to make amends because I was formerly incarcerated and now I'm home and I have to make up because the world wants me to to be living my life uh helping other people because of my crime I've served my time for my crime I dared myself to become my best self so now I'm trying to walk in my best self and be God's just just representative on earth through my actions, word and deed, but I don't want to get caught up in that mindset that I have to be living, making, uh, living amends every day. And I don't mean to offend nobody. I'm just beginning to understand the needs and the the, the complications of reentry and, and the 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 effects of incarceration. And so I'm starting to see the lack um in 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 a in a whole picture and i'm glad that god is showing me this because he's also blessing me with tools Mm -hmm. to fill in these gaps so as a woman (laughs) so i'm sorry i don't want to take up too much time thank you Um, always that's so so impactful and so powerful i I wanted to continue with what you had just said that reentry is lacking resources and i know that's not a question that you guys submitted but i kind of wanted to go with that if we could answer that question, Chief G and Cynthia, Laura and Ganea, what is specifically lacking for women in, in re-entry and what, what could we provide or what resources do we need? And then we can move on to the other questions. Um, can I speak? Yes, ma'am. Um, re-entry, uh, for me, what, I, what I've what i taken out of it, I've worked a little bit with ARC and what's funny is when I went in, um, I was homeless for 20 years um i was out on the streets with my kids and um if it wasn't for people that i know sleeping in my car sleeping in garages sleeping on floors everywhere with my kids right um motels just doing whatever we could um but i did notice before i had one in um what was the problem then was that there wasn't enough um, places that took women with children or if they took women with children they could not be at a certain age. So I had one place say, yeah, you can bring all six of your uh, children, but your seventh one who's at a certain age, I think he was like 11 or 12, he can't come. Well, what the hell am I supposed to do with them? I'm, I'm homeless, single mother. What am I supposed to do with my son? Just leave him outside? Like, so what I'm trying to say is that, so I get out, fast forward, get out, and I'm, I'm working with ARC and I'm, I'm making a list and I'm trying to find places they take women for children, like emergency places. And do you know that that lack is still there? It's a 10 something plus years later, and there's so much being poured into reentry, but yet these places are still very few. And that is outrageous because with women, we come out and we're usually the ones that get our kids back. But yet there's no, there's no spaces for us. And so that, that disconnect is still really there. And so what happens is the kids stay in foster system until the mom can get her stuff together. And like with me, I had a type of family where, yeah, I mean, I was supposed to do all of that. As soon as I got my place, my family was like, here's your kids. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? But not all women have it like that. Some women literally have to pluck their kids out of the system. And if they're having any, why can't we have reentry where a woman could go in and grab her kids right away I know there is some because I was at the Phoenix house and they did have it, but they're not that many and there should be way, way, way more. That's all I have to say. <laughs> oh, that's so important. And, and Chi Chi, um, did you want to add to that? Yes, I feel as though um, when women come home, first of all, I'm going to say that in, in my community, the black community, Um, There's a stigma in regards to talking to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And so therefore, when I walk out the doors of a routine that has been created for me for the last past 16 months or 50 years, I'm walking out to a system that I don't understand. And there's no, there's no um, safeguard for me to be able to speak or have my family speak because I think that the family of the women who have been incarcerated are still at a place where they have been since we left them. And we come out 
having the opportunity to be able to heal, to be able to speak to someone in regards to what our true feelings and thoughts and behaviors are. And so I feel as though that cliche of meeting them where they're at. If mm -hmm. I'm meeting them where they're at, it's only because they haven't had the opportunity to be able to speak to someone about their hurts and their pain. The other thing is that I come out and I might have saved a certain amount of money after making $48 a month or $150 a month, but it's still not enough to survive out here. And there's no safeguard in me being able to immediately get employment or if I get employment is substandard to my living because my, my teaching was that it's 33% for rent where I'm working a job and it's over half of that amount for rent. So there's no housing for us, you know? So if we, we, we peel back the onion, we get to the core first and then work our way out. And so all of those challenges that we have met, it's not like you come into an assembly line where I'm gonna to go to a program, there's gonna be a counselor or a guidance uh, person there that teaches me how to navigate so that like the lady said before me, Either I have children and they need a space to, for me to get my children back, I must have a space. And then for me to be in a position where I'm working substandard jobs because the training that I'm getting while I'm incarcerated does not match the training outside, you know? And then when you uh, finally acquire a place, your whole thought is about how much I have to work in order to be able to pay my rent. And then there's no life as Janae said. So there's no fun because even with me, I work graveyard shift. And by the time I come home, I sleep for a couple of hours and then I'm in school and it starts all over again. And so for me, when we talk about reentry, especially for women, I think that we should have somebody in place that can help us navigate the normal or the natural things. Um, the young lady spoke about her age. Well, I'm 64, so I'm double up trying to catch up with my life. And all those things that have been in place through other women my age, I don't have those things. And so I'm trying to acquire those things because if something happens to me, I leave my children the same way I left them 20 years ago. You know, and that's not where I wanna be. And so if I was thinking about reentry, I would think about what particular goals do I have in mind? I would have someone to talk to me in regards to my goals that are reachable, whether they're short-term or long-term. But the immediate basic needs, food, shelter, and clothing, that should be in place before I even hit pay dirt. And that's the way I feel about that. No, that's important. Um, Laura, did you want to add to that too as well, please? And Ganea, please. Sure. So. Um, I agree, you know, with everything that's been shared thus far. Um, one of the only things I, I guess I can add is, you know, when I got out, I didn't have anywhere to go. And I ended up finding a sober living to go to that would take me. And, you know, here's the problem with that is, you know, when you serve a long sentence and you've been down for so many years, oppressed, right? Um, being told when to eat, when to shower, when you're allowed to use a bathroom, you know, all these rules and regulations, you don't want to get out and have to follow rules, those types of rules and regulations. Like I'm 37 years old. Are you going to tell me I have a 10 o'clock curfew? You know, it, it, it just, it was a little too much, you know, we we're in there dying literally. And you get this, this opportunity to hit freedom. And then you, so you have these, you know, um, this excitement about going home and being free just to end up somewhere where they're telling you, you have to, you know, scrub the bathroom every so often and do this and be here and do that. And, and I understand the concept behind it, but it just didn't fit for me. And after speaking to some of the other women that I know that, that did long sentences and have been, have come home, you know, the consensus has been pretty, um, pretty there, you know, everybody kind of agrees, like, um, and then uh, just in particular, in my situation, you know, that that home that I was at, I was there for 30 days before I got out, because um, their, their requirements of me um, 
got in the way of like what I was doing and what I was doing was getting jobs. And I was working so much that the house manager was like, um, you're working too much and you're, you're not going to have time to do your chores. I'm like, wait a minute. I thought we're supposed to be acclimating to the real life and real life. I can't tell my boss, Oh, I'm not going to come to work because I have to scrub the toilet at my house. Like that's not how real life works. Right? So I was getting pushback for doing the things that I thought we're supposed to do, which is come home and integrate into society. Right. And by integrating into society, well, we got to, participate in, in, in the economy as well, which means get a job so you can pay taxes and stay out of the people's ways. Right. And so that was a problem at that home. I, I was working too much. I never thought, you know, I'd, I, that would become a problem. And so, you know, I spoke to my parole agent and I was like, you know, here's what's going on. And then it was another thing where, you know, my family lives outside of the County. They lived in San Diego and I'm in orange County. And, um, it was like they wanted to come down and see me, but I couldn't have an overnight. And, and I'm like, with my family, like, I just did 15 years and I can't spend the night with my family. Like I just got out. So there's a lot of, of little things like that, that I feel like need to be worked on. Or, um, you know, we need to put the magnifying glass on reentry because sometimes just having uh, like saying, Oh, you know what? You could go to this sober living or you could do that. It's not conducive to, the progress that we're supposed to be making. You know, some of the rules and regulations that they have are, are meant for, and I understand I was at a sober living, you know, it's meant for people that were addicts and that are actively using and all these other things. But yes, I am an addict. You know, I, I had a, a drug problem before I got arrested, but I stopped using the day I got arrested. So I had been sober for 15 years. And so what works for one person doesn't work for everybody else. And I feel like we kind of need to, to, put the magnifying glass on that and take a closer look at what we're doing and how we're supporting um, the people that are getting out from serving long sentences, especially women. I mean, we need a safe place to be uh, ourselves and, um, you know, with our children if need be. Thank you, Laura, for that. Um, I, I wanted to move the conversation into your work with the LARP, with LARP as part of the Leaders Training Academy. Um, I know every one of you have worked closely with Anthony and, and Troy and Joe Paul, um, but I wanted you to share your experience. How has your work with the Leader Training Academy, uh, you know, again, contributed to your re-entry uh, process and, and just again, like uh, Ganea said, living, and that I think is so important. But please share your experiences with the Leader Training Academy, how it helped you out. I would take that first. Okay. Um, when I met Anthony and Juliana, uh, it blew my mind because they didn't hear me. They listened. They listened and it was, it was very, very different because you can come across a lot of people that tell you a lot of things. However, those young people listen. And so it got me excited. And when I was incarcerated, I was an activist. I learned how to speak the language of the younger people, the older people. I learned how to negotiate and mediate for the young ladies there. I learned how to be in a position of creating curriculum for those things that we didn't have in place. And so when I finally came home and I had an opportunity to meet Anthony and Giuliani, and then I had an opportunity to meet Mr. Vaughn, it was amazing because they opened up the doors for me to be a part of something larger than myself. They opened up the doors for me to hear the same type of voice that I had that wanted to make change in the world. And so that experience has given me the motivation and I've taken the initiative to continue to grow. It doesn't matter how old I am, it matters to me how teachable I am. And so it's taught me a lot. It's taught me to see myself as my better self. LARP has um, given me several different opportunities and different venues in which I could take advantage of. I was a Toastmaster and still they offered me public speaking. Um, when it came to me being sick, 
They said prayers for me and sent well wishes to my family and myself. So it's not just an organization that deals with reentry. For me, it's an organization that deals with people personally and collectively. And so I know that I may sometimes like call Anthony like in the middle of the day and he'll take out the time to hear what it is I need to say or what my ideas are. And so being a part of LARP and being a part of the Leadership Academy, I can see that it's very progressive. I can see that they have um, futuristic thoughts, not just being in a place and staying there, but they do not allow you to become uh, complacent. They encourage you to move forward and become your better self. And I just wanna say thank you. And being in a position of coming home and having people actually listen to you, I was just expressing that to my daughter today. Um, she listens to me. And then when she, she knows the difference and when I need to have advice or when I just need someone to hear me. And that's what I feel about LARP. So thank, thank you, doctor. Thank you, Chi Chi. Ganea, yes, please jump in. <laughs> Because LARP has been amazing. It has just the concept of it to um, have a place at the table. So, uh, you know, they taught me so much. I have such a vision in my head of things that I would like to accomplish and go forward and helping other people. And this has taught me and given me the tools how to do that. So they taught us that, you know, coming home, uh, Everybody, you're you're in there wondering what do people care? What are people doing to help us? Uh, why aren't nobody listening to us? So when we come home, to know that our voice matters in these in these uh, decision makings, like to to show us how to get a place at the table, to show us how to make things happen, to show us how to put together the pieces of the puzzle, so that okay, I have this idea. They gave me the tools. Okay, they showed me this is what you do. Like it's amazing. It's phenomenal. I feel like they they've given me tools to launch me forward in life and I must I must um, agree with Chi Chi it's been more of a family because a lot of other things that I'm doing it makes me feel restricted and like Laura said we don't want to be restricted we've been they've been telling me what to do how to hold account to these people for 18 years so they gave me room to spread my wings. They instructed me, they taught me, they were there for me, but they also gave me room. And that's what I really loved. And Anthony, you're the bomb. He has been there. He, you can call Anthony and be like, hey man, I got this problem. This is what's going on. And he's there, he shows up, not even on his work hours in, in his own time. Like if he notices, he, he pays attention. He'll see on the screen, you're not your best self. And he'll call and say, hey, is there a problem? Is something going on how can I help he has when I had questions about credit and different types of stuff nobody was there to show me but Anthony was there I'm like Anthony man I need to build some credit what <laughs> I need to do this I need to do that and he instructed me so he was in the actively in the process of my re-entry teaching me vital tools that I needed to move forward and now you know I got my credit I understand this my score is good you know and I I, I give all that to Anthony because he was there he's like okay I got a video let's show you you need to know about the stocks let me tell you about how to uh, enrich the people let me give you the this stock lesson like he's been there teaching me important things that's not just gonna fade when the wind blows they're sustainable things that allows me to stand my foot on top of a foundation to move forward not only for myself but to teach other people I'm like everything that he taught me I'm going teaching somebody else I'm like oh you need to follow him because <laughs> he taught and that's not just Anthony, it's the whole LARP, you know, it's the umbrella of LARP and um, just who they have been, what they have taught me. They taught me tools to navigate. So now I know if I want to launch my women's program and this and this and that, you guys showed me, you sat me at the pay, pay, uh, table with with people who were in those positions. You taught me how to have the conversations. You taught me how to look at what they're doing, find the loopholes and come up with a solution. Like, okay, well, here you go. Here, I need to sit at the table. This is what's happening. Can we talk? You taught me how to do that talk. So I think that's very important because now I can go forward and my dreams are tangible. They're, they're coming true. So I, I thank you. And that's what LARP, it's been so much more. I could talk for hours about what LARP has done, but to sum it up, that's, I'm thankful. 
This is excellent. Um, Laura and, and Cynthia, did you want to add and, and contribute to this? How has LARP, the tra you know, the training academy um, um, helped you with re-entry and just, you know, your experiences with working with LARP? Can she hear me? Laura, can you hear me? Yes, oh. I, I was waiting to see if Cynthia wanted to go first. Oh, uh, it's okay. Um, man, I mean, I can just, push repeat on what uh, Chi Chi and Janae just shared. Um, LARP has been, man, a breath of fresh air. You know, um, I, I participate in a lot of other community, um, uh, with a lot of other community organizations, and I'm not a lot, a lot but a few others. And, um, you know, LARP is different. LARP is um, comprised of people uh, with lived experience, and um, that was amazing to to hear. I remember the first time I sat down at at um, I think it was our intro meeting uh, where Troy spoke and Anthony spoke and um, everybody was shared and it was just like, wow, like here's some executives and some you know um, program managers and and people who have come from where I came from. And so it's just like, all right, it, that by itself, if I would have done, if gone to no other meetings, but that one, that lit something inside me that goes, you know what? Yeah, it is possible. I always, I mean, I'm, I'm an optimist by nature. You know, I always feel like I can do anything, I honestly, but to see it in action, to see um, the passion that Anthony and Troy and everyone else brings and Joe Paul, the, the, the passion and the energy that they bring to the table and that, how they encourage us, you know, they uplift. They're, they, they, they literally sat us down with, I don't remember all the initials of SBJC, you guys know, but, it, and it's like, we sat at that meeting and there was Congress people there, there was people who I would never be in the room with had it not been for LARP. And for LARP to sit there and tell me, you are just as valuable at this table as the congressperson that's going to speak, as the leader of that organization, as the, because without you, what they're trying to do isn't going to get accomplished. And to empower somebody in that way is something, it's a gift that you can never repay, I feel like, because that confidence is, is like, okay, it really does step you up. It makes you feel a valued it makes you feel, and I don't care how confident you are, because I consider myself to be a highly confident individual, you know, but it's like being seated there, coming fresh out of prison, like, wow, really? It's awesome. And then, uh, like Janae shared, you know, uh, just being seated there and being able to take notes and to pay attention and to hear like, okay, this is how they start a legislative bill, or this is how it, it even starts, how the conversation gets started. And then it goes from there to this table, to this meeting, to here, and then you put it together. And it's uh, an amazing experience. It's something that um, I, I hope I'll get to redo again, um, you know, cause you pick a little bit extra up every time. And, um, but yeah, LARP has been incredible and um, I'm super grateful to be part of it. You know, just to be a participant is um, an honor, honestly, and I'm very grateful. Thank you, Laura, for your, um, your what you were talking about. I, I appreciate that. Cynthia, did you want to add to this? Or unmute yourself. It's okay. Um, I I'm sorry, I, my, my signal is going in and out, but I'm literally stuck in traffic, so hopefully it won't get messed up. I just want to thank LARP. LARP has, you know, I've been out for a little while. Of course, 10 years has been a while, but um, it, it's kept me connected with what I'm doing. Um, I really enjoyed being around everybody there. Um, and they also to have, it's funny because what I took out of it, maybe is not what everybody else took out of it, but like, you know, asking us if we want to take pictures, you know, or um, having us involved in different, um, different forums and different discussions and really feeling like uh, having us really feel like our, our voice mattered, um, like at the Measure J meetings, like we need to be there. Um, we needed to take notes. What did you think? 
all those things matter because then it, it, we really feel or I really felt like what I was taking in, what I heard, what my opinion mattered, like it all, it all plays to something. You're not just sitting there like a fly on the wall, like they're really encouraging you to speak up. Uh, what did you think about things or even about the policy, like what type of policies would you like to see? How can we go ahead and see if we can bring this to the table? All that stuff matters and it makes you feel like your time wasn't wasted. Like, like every oh, she's muted. It's okay. Okay, I think we lost her real fast. She'll come back on. We can grab her back on. Yeah, Cynthia, yeah, yes. okay. Cynthia, you yeah. cut out. So talk to I'm me. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's in traffic. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't know where you uh, heard or didn't hear, but um, I just want to thank Alart once again. Uh, they also, too, um, stepped up and helped us with the letter of endorsement for CSUDH. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a, um, a, this called Scholars United, which is a formerly incarcerated student organization and um, system and practice student. Um, I'm one of the co-founders there. And they co-signed something for us. And once again, I, I just, I cannot thank you guys enough. I, I really appreciate you. Thank you, Cynthia, for that. Um, as we move in our program, we wanted to save some time for our audience to ask questions, but I wanted to ask you what your plans are. Where are you going? Um, Janea, you talked about your own plans. Chichi, I think you alluded to that too. Um, I wanna hear what, what creativity and, and what you ladies are doing. Um, since, you know, utilizing the resources at large. So, you know, I want a five-year plan or something of that nature from you. Um, but please share share where you, you want to be the next year, you know, after we get out of this pandemic and this mess that we're in. Chi Chi, let me hear from you first. Okay. So the first thing I would really love to do is have my own podcast. Um, within the next five years, I plan on being a CEO and founder of a very lucrative uh, apparel company. I also want to be able to speak to Washington, D.C. On, pre on prison reform and being able to focus on the dignities of families of the formerly or still incarcerated. And so those things have become very passionate to me in regards to knowing how my personal experience was. And so to be able to speak to people in a position of actually hearing us and making a difference, you know, um, that's very, very important to me because I'm a prod I'm a born in the 50s, a product of the 60s. So I know that we can make a change. And with organizations such as LARP, they help you to be heard. And so prison reform has been very, very important to me. My baby daughter has done a lot of uh, activism with foster care and Project Rebound, those type of things. And so I can hear her whisper in my ear sometime about, hey, let's get this done. So I feel as though as soon as the, the world opens up again, I will be performing, I will be a CEO, I will have my own podcast and you will hear about me in Washington, DC. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, yes ma'am. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm um, Ganea. Um, I am currently going to be CEO of something that's really great that has to do with reentry. I don't want to say too much because it's still in the making, but it, it's just phenomenal. I can't wait till everybody sees. But also, I'm also in the process of being trained to become um, uh, an entrepreneur. Well, this someone is training me who trains women to be entrepreneurs, but I'm in the process of opening my own transitional housing for women, um, not only one, but several. Um, and they're going to be fashion different from your normal transitional home. But I also expressed that I would like to also house women after that six months period. And it, it just, it's an umbrella that entails a lot of stuff in there. There's a lot of details in there because I wanted to make sure that I was covering all aspects. So I'm actually in the process of training uh, to get my own nonprofit and everything right now um, with people who have already done this type of thing. And it would be my own. I would not uh, have to answer an account to nobody. Um, so I will have the freedom to do uh, and design it as I please um, to help the ladies that's uh, coming after me because housing is something that's very important. Hey, 
why am I at, uh, trying to find housing? I can just create my own. So I had the opportunity to do that. And also, like I said, to um, house women afterwards so they can get permanent housing. It's going to have to do with motherhood and just everything, everything that you can possibly think of from my perception that I think and feel women need from my personal experience and from me continuing to talk to the ladies that's still incarcerated of their needs. And it's also going to entail doing boxes for the ladies, giving back to them, uh, podcasts is involved, um, getting their voice heard from outside. So it's going to be women's voice coming from outside on various topic, topic subjects. And it's just so much. But um, I'm in the process of doing all these things. Currently, I work for Healing Dialogue and Action. I'm on the leadership board at TPW. And I currently have curriculum inside of the women's prison that I do. Uh, I, I put together um, formerly incarcerated women. So we actually are taking the curriculum with them because I was able to send that video in there. When the prisons open up, I also will be going. I'm filling out my brown card right now to get back in there so that I can um, take a curriculum in there that we're creating and um, a few other things. But that's the gist of it right now. You're so cool. Thank you for sharing that. Seriously. Um, Lara, do you have anything else to add? Or, you know, um, Cynthia, what were your plans or, or what are you trying to accomplish within the next year or two? If you guys are still on the, on the line. Yes, there she is. Laura, can you hear us still? She might be frozen. Darn Zoom, I'm telling you. Oh, I was on mute. I'm sorry. It's so <laughs> awesome. Um, you know, I, I am similar. I have lofty, lofty goals. Um, you know, the simple, I, I want to be a homeowner eventually, but as far as like the things that I'm, that like that LARP has helped me understand, I definitely want to, um, you know, get my career in, um, uh, community service, like just community administration or public administration, social work, social administration, whatever it is. Uh, I want to eventually have, you know, my own nonprofit um, to help people. Housing is also very important to me. Um, so, you know, I want to build some houses, uh, apartments, condos, something uh, to help people. Um, I, I've learned so much, you know, the stocks, you know, learned about that too with Anthony. Um, bugged him about that for several hours, I'm sure. <laughs> but um, I, I, I do, I want to help empower people and, and I want to help them understand and, and navigate life uh, out of coming out of prison or anywhere. Um, I do some work too with um, immigration stuff, um, which is also very um, near and dear to my heart, uh, personally impacted. But um, yeah, I have I've been doing so much stuff. I, I just got linked up also through LARP with a P2E. So, you know, I'm going to be doing some certification programs with them um, so that I can kind of get into my career and, and, and build my resume up and, and ensure that I get where I want to go, you know? And like I said earlier, I kind of feel like I'm that kind of person, right? Like whatever I set my mind to do, I'm going to do it. And, um, what I want ultimately at the end of the day is just really simple. I just want to help people. That's it. I want to help people. And in whatever vein or aspect or lane God puts that in, I'm mean, I have my own ideas, but I honestly, I want to kind of leave my slate blank. You know, uh, one of the directors that I worked for in, in, in prison once shared, you know, people, they, you know, they, they, get a blank piece of paper and they write their roadmap on it. And then they give it to God and say, you know, this is what I want to do with my life. Bless this, you know? Um, but isn't it better to hand God a blank piece of paper and say, like, you write my roadmap. You know, that's kind of where I'm at right now is, is I'm just giving it to him. He knows I want to help people and I'm ready and willing to do that in whatever capacity I can. And um, those are really just, you know, some of my goals, um, besides, you know, working and, and getting myself situated in a home somewhere, I want to be a property owner. It's um, been, you know, in the Hispanic community, we tend to live like 100 people in one house. And, you know, I want to show my siblings that, you know, we can each have our own house. We don't have to share one. You know, everybody, you get a house, you get a house, you get a house. 
everybody gets a house. So I want to, I want to set the, set that standard. So yeah, those are my uh, near goals. Thank you so much for that. Um, Cynthia, are you still with us? Can you add to that? Yes. Um, what my goals are, are to, well, everything with me is education. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that uh, within the year we'll have a project rebound on campus. Um, that's the main goal right now, bridging that, um, helping bridge the uh, prison to education pipeline um, at CSUDH. Um, I also hope, hope to be um, a teaching within the year, crossing my fingers. I just need to get those um, applications in, especially now that. I think she cut out. Cynthia, can so, you hear us? Um, uh, okay. Yeah. It's Did okay. you hear me or? No, finish up. You're talking about education and curriculum and yeah, talk about, uh, mm -hmm. I was to talk about, did you hear about Project Rebound? I want Project Rebound SESUDH within the year. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, and I'm and, and, yeah. and, yes, and hoping that I'd be, a, um, you know, use all that education that I got since I've been out of prison um, to become a, um, a professor. That's, that's my ultimate goal. And to get, and it's so funny that uh, the lady before me had, was talking about living in one single spot. I live in a single with three other people. So me and the kids and hopefully get into a. I think she cut out, but I got that last part though. Cynthia, That's are you all goals for me at some, you know, some level? Yeah. Okay. That's it. Thank you, Cynthia. I think you were you were cut out but you were talking about housing, which I think is important. Um, as we wrap this up, and yes, Robert, nine hundred eighty-seven dollars last month. Absolutely, I just saw that comment. Um, as we start to to move into our audience questions and kind of wrap this up and everything, I wanted you guys, you know, you ladies, just really quickly, what are for an audience that is not familiar with this topic or students that are not familiar with this, what are some of the barriers that we need to completely dismantle or abolish? If we are talking about re-entry, mass incarceration, the carceral state, you know, white supremacy on the landscape, we can take our pick, but what are some of the barriers um, that I think the rest of the world should know about? And I'd like to hear from you ladies on that. Chi Chi. For me, I believe that some of the barriers are being able to really ban the box. Even though you say you ban the box, the box is, has not been banned. And so um, also education. I feel as though that education has always been very important um, in my family. And I believe that the more that you know, the more you grow. And so to be empowered in a position of educating yourself, whether it's academically, spiritually, or just everyday information, you should be able to be in a position of knocking that wall down and being treated as an equal in that arena. So those are the things that I find, um, no matter what it is that you continue to do, if you have some type of criminal background, it seems to be an invisible, invisible barrier because they'll tell that story before they look at you as a person. That's important to even acknowledge it and just to continue that dialogue about Chi Chi. Absolutely. Um, Janae or, or Laura or Cynthia, you know, what are some of the barriers if you were to talk to somebody that just doesn't have a clue about what's going on and you need to tell them what are some of the barriers? Uh, I would say education that they need to be, uh, they need in prison to be able to get something higher than an AA degree. I mean, you're capping people at AA degrees and they're getting multiple AA degrees and a lot of those classes don't account for anything once they get out. People want to educate themselves and we do know through um, research that the higher the education, the less likelier the person is to precipitate. Why not allow masters in prison or a PhD? Like it does not make sense why, they're, why they cap that. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Laura uh, or Jenea. Uh, go ahead, Janea. Go ahead. 
Uh, no, I would. I agree too. As far as the education, um, when we're incarcerated, we know nothing about technology. Um, they don't equip us for a lot of the things that we face out here. Um, like I said, I was calling Anthony, asking him questions that uh, they should have gave me some type of reentry, transitioning. That's something that educated me in um, certain types of things that were realistic that was going to help me to um, move forward out here and not stagnate myself because a lot of times. I became frustrated because I didn't understand. And so it, and then my mother had to have a lot of patience with me because I was frustrated because I couldn't understand. I just didn't understand the concept of. So, um, so that is very important. Also, I think that they just need to, uh, the way that they deal with the women, the, the the way that it's designed, the way that it's created, uh, women incarceration, it's just it just needs to be redesigned. It's it's not like I was saying in the beginning, uh, they're not trained to cultivate us. Like Troy was saying, it's a system that was created by men for men. Women have been oppressed for so long and overlooked for so long. Um, so things like this that allow us to have that voice, um, you and you you empower us and you educate us and you offer us a place that the table I can't say how important that is um so those barriers of just how we deal with women that's incarcerated um of educating of uh technology uh, just it, it's just so much so yeah no and I agree I, yeah thank you for that I, I think people that haven't experienced this need to really hear that you know Laura I wanted to finish up with you on that so I hate to sound like a broken record, but you know, housing is so important. Um, that's like one of the biggest barriers. Housing and employment for me were the biggest barriers um, upon release. And um, I know that, you know, we can't wave, wave a magic wand and fix everything overnight, but we've got to chip away little by little. And, you know, I, I really believe in um, educating our community about, you um, people that are incarcerated and, um, you know, the stigma, I really feel like we need to do a better job of bridging the gap from, you know, one side of the wall to the other. Uh, people's opinions about people that are getting out of prison are, are, are staggeringly low. And I was shocked, you know, and it honestly makes me sad sometimes that, you know, I'm, I'm working somewhere and, you know, I, I work at, at, at a Mazda warehouse right now and uh, the main guy comes up to me uh, last week and he said, you know, I just had a conversation about you with Mazda, like the main Mazda people. And I was like, uh oh, somebody found out about my past. What's going on? And I'm like, well, why? Well, what's going on? And he's like, Laura, your numbers are through the roof. You are three times higher than any other employee that we have. You're, you're the rate that you put work out. And inside, I wanted so bad to tell him, do you know that I just got out from doing 15 years? I wanted to so bad, just let them know and, and let your Mazda people know too, because they don't hire felons. So, you know, I, I just, they don't know that I'm a felon and, and I so much want to share and, and put it out there to the world. Like the people that are your best employees, probably nine times out of 10 have a criminal record and they're having to go above and beyond just to even get their foot in the door. And they're going to be your best outputters. And so, yeah, I, I want, I feel like that's a barrier that we need to kind of work at and, and, and chip away at in organizations um, like LARP and, and um, you know, some of the other organizations that they partner with, I mean, the list is endless, um, you know, just to, to be part of that, to be community driven and um, to attend webinars like this, just to educate yourself and to take this information back to your family and your friends and your employers and let them know like, hey, these people are not what we think they are, you know? Um, I think those are the biggest things for me. And I, I just want to add to that. Yeah, go ahead. Go right ahead. Yes, ma'am. Having a seat at the table because when you give us a seat at the table, guess what? They're seeing us. Mm -hmm. They're seeing us. Mm -hmm. So that's extremely important, what Laura said. And that's why I just was saying that that's the most important thing. Uh, let's break these stigmas. So I thank you. For being that's so that. important. Um, I wanted to uh, just kind of further develop what Laura had said earlier about barriers with immigration status. I know that some of my students are undocumented and they've spoken to me about this, but I, Laura, 
you know, was this a barrier for you as you, you know, you know, left prison, if you will, and then got into the re-entry and, and had problems finding jobs. Can you, you know, talk a little bit about that or what would you give advice on, on that subject? Because my students, you know, they, it bothers their soul, you know, how they're not accepted, how they, they feel like they have to hide, you know? Yeah. I didn't think I was going to cry today. Okay. I'm not, I'm going to keep it together. Oh, keep it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I am a permanent resident. Uh, but because I was incarcerated for so long, uh, my resident status uh, expired. You have to renew every 10 years. So obviously I was not able to renew because I was incarcerated for over a decade. And um, so, yeah, it is really hard. You do have to hide. There's even some webinars that I've been asked to speak at that I have to use an alias. You know, I was nervous about this because my face is going to be on there. Um, you know, uh, I am I am up for uh, potential deportation because of my felony convictions. It doesn't matter that I was brought here when I was three months old. It doesn't matter that this is the only place I've ever known. It doesn't matter that um, I served my time. I successfully completed so many different rehabilitative programs. I completed the ankle monitor successfully. Um, I work very, very hard. I have three jobs um, just to, you know, make ends meet because of my immigration status. I have to have these menial, not menial, I don't wanna call them that because you know what, they're honest jobs. Yeah. And, and, and the people, when I first started working in a warehouse, I was like, oh my gosh, my hat's off to the people that work here. I never knew how hard a warehouse job is. It is insane. And um, I have to do it, you know, and I have medical issues as well that, you know, I get sick and I get tired and my bones hurt, but I can't stop because I have to pay my bills. And um, I know my value. I know my worth. I know that I shouldn't be in these particular jobs. Uh, I know that I should be doing something that brings my heart joy and that helps people, but I can't because of my immigration status. And so it is very um, discouraging and disheartening. Um, I am in the process of filing, actually, my gubernatorial pardon application just went into the governor's office, I want to say, two days ago. Um, so please, if you guys will, send prayers up for that for me. And we're, you know, praying for a, pres a gubernatorial pardon so that um, I can then go before an immigration judge and plead my case there and ask them to you know, cancel my removal from this country because what would I, I have no idea where I would go or what I would do um, in a country I've never known. And um, it is something I that I also believe in um, very strongly that we need to kind of work on as a nation. Um, our immigration laws and things like that are a little bit insane. I kind of feel like, you know, I nobody cared where I was from when I was winning awards. And when I was, you know, bringing things to the table, nobody cared that I was born in Mexico. But, you know, I made one mistake when I was 21 years old. I mean, I've made several mistakes in my life, but I made a mistake when I was 21 years old that, you know, was very dangerous. And, um, but I learned and I became a better person, you know, in there. And it just doesn't seem to matter. It doesn't seem to matter. You know, they're still willing to yank me out of here and throw me somewhere else. And, and it's scary. It's scary and it's disheartening. But yes, um, it, it's, it's a huge barrier, you know, and, and I know it's not popular, but um, it happens, you know, it happens to a lot of us and um, it's really scary. Laura, thank you for sharing that personal um, narrative. You know, a lot of my students were scared when we saw ICE on our college campus and everything, like fearful. And as an educator, it breaks your heart. And as an anti-racist educator, the fact that we even have to talk about contested borders in a carceral state that has a racial caste system. It, it's in the year 2021 is, is just still, still problematic. So I want people to hear your story. And, and I do like agree with what Summer said, borders, you know, they're just, it's contested, you know? So I appreciate your authenticity and, and your honesty with that. Um, I just wanted to close out this session. Um, one, to express gratitude for this authentic dialogue with each of the four ladies. And I just wanted to end this session as, you know, to ask this last question, who are you today? Who do you want people to know about you? Who are you? You know, after you've gone through all of this trauma and success too, who are you today in the year 2021? Chi Chi, do you want to start? 
first, uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you, doctor, for having me here, as well as the other mm -hmm. ladies that um, I know very, very dearly to my heart. I feel as though I am empowered. I am resilient. I am humbled. And I'm filled with gratitude because against all odds, I made it to the other side with prayer and grace. And so for me, I am determined to make a difference and leave my imprint in this world. And even though uh, incarceration was uh, something that I did not plan, however, however, it's become a part of my life. And um, the people who are near and dear to me have been affected by that in such a way. And I hear about making amends. I feel as though my life has been priceless. And because of those things that I've gone through, uh, I believe that God has made me stronger and that my life has purpose. And so that's who I am today. A, a woman who has purpose in this life. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, Jenea. Uh, who I am today, that's the question, right? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> who are you today? Let them know. I'm a woman of value. I'm a woman of worth. I am a woman that has so much to offer this world. I am a woman who is going to change and, and, and not only is going to change, but changes lives daily, only through the power and the grace of God because of the wisdom and the journey that he has took me through. Just like Chi Chi said, we were incarcerated, but God utilized that to press most valuable things inside of us that we're learning today you know the seed is planted but it comes a time for watering so I feel like you know things are being watered and I'm a woman with the name that's gonna make a difference so. thank you for that thank you for that Laura or Cynthia please <coughs> um mine is just I'm a warrior that's it like, that's it. That's all. I've survived stuff that I'm surprised I've survived. And I, I won't stop fighting to change things. So I consider myself a warrior. Thank you, Cynthia. Laura, we'll end with you. <clears throat> um, I was listening to the women talk, you know, Janae and Chi Chi and Cynthia. Um, I'm all of those things too, you know? So I was like, I had to say it in one word, you know, what would I say? Like, who am I? Who am I today? Um, it's something I would have never, ever said in my life, but I'm important today. Yeah. You know, that's something I, I, for that to even come out of my mouth, it's like to be able to acknowledge that within myself, you know, that power and that assertiveness, you know, um, some, uh, for many years, you know, especially in prison, you feel like you don't matter, you know, but today I matter and um, I'm grateful. Thank you so much for that. Um, as we close out our event, I, I hope that our audience and everything that these ladies have presented to us today, one is wisdom. And I, and I want you guys to take this with you. My students that are in the audience, I'm speaking to you directly on this too. These ladies just offered so much valuable wisdom and knowledge about something that I don't know anything about because I haven't experienced it, but we need to change and dismantle that. So I'm very grateful to share space with every one of you. Um, when I first met Anthony, you know, we talked about, you know, providing dialogue and space, you know, for the leaders and everything. And out of these conversations that Anthony had every Monday with Azalea Camacho and Kendall, um, we decided that we wanted to create an archive to preserve the narratives of women that are incarcerated and, and men as well. And so we are gonna start collecting oral histories from people that are formerly incarcerated because we think it is so important to preserve your wisdom um, so we can dismantle the carceral state. And we hope that we can preserve your stories from tonight in our inaugural oral collection. And this is something that Anthony and, and Joe Paul and I talked a lot about um, because we don't have anything to preserve yet. And we want to, again, um, you know, make this available to everybody, especially as we dismantle 
the prison system in the state of California. So we are so grateful. Um, but that oral history will start this summer. And we want you ladies to be a part of this and, and help us collect our community narrative as well. Anthony, did you want to add anything before we close out about that? That was just something that we came up with and we're so excited for that. So I, I just like to say that on behalf of LARP, uh, we're, we're excited about um, you know, us coming together and actually um, you know, coming, coming to uh, conclude that that plan that we that we, that we were thinking about, we we're throwing out there, we we're brainstorming a few meetings, and uh, very proud and excited to have long to to, to um, that launch coming up. And um, just want to say that I'm very proud and honored to to have been you know be part of LARP and to have been um, serving for the women that are here on this panel and the rest of the men that are in the leaders training academy. Um, you know, I am just like you. Um, I serve time. I'm formerly incarcerated. I am no better than you. I want all of you guys to outshine me and, you know, do whatever you want to do in life, but just to know that you have support, you have my support, and you have large support as well. So thank you very much for everything you ladies do, and um, I will be there no matter what, okay? Thank you, Anthony, for that. I, I feel like I have to ask Pastor Vaughn to close us out tonight. Um, if you wanted to say anything, any last words before we end our event tonight, um, you know, uh, uh, Troy, that would be lovely. Wow, well, I've been crying all night, and uh, just golly, proud. I feel like a daddy here. I mean, for me to be standing in vision and seeing, you know, I'm overjoyed because what I've envisioned in terms of creating a platform, um, not just a network, but a platform for people to. Um, become all that they were created to be and to see the realization of that to have somebody like Anthony on our team a part of our family leading seeing his impact on other people um, it's inspiring it reminds me of why I get up every day and to fight for our cause to hear um, stories um, and the passion of all of our women that spoke tonight um, I'm, I'm now empowered to do more. Um, one of the things we are doing in our next um, year in our cohort is we're going to be adding a housing component to it, where an emerging um, component where we actually put both men and women in their own units and dwelling and being a part of a community and learning a lot of different things and hearing what the women were saying tonight lets me know that we're on the right path for doing that. Also, um, creating opportunities for um, our brothers and sisters that are suffering from their un undocumented status and how do we get them employed and not having to live in fear um, behind a felony. So creating a pathway in communication. I will be sending a letter of support to the governor for you. Um, and so you need to know that, Lord, that we will be um, sending a letter of support and standing alongside you with any process of court that you have to go through you won't be standing alone and you know i'm prepared to let them know that i can petition for you to have at least a temporary work permit at one of our companies that we have set up so whatever we need to do to make sure that you can work here legally while we fight for your immigration status to be returned to you know that you have our full support you know i'm gonna do all within my power um to help keep you here um you know this this is the kind of stuff that we we come into these spaces for to make sure that we can see you know gifting you know and opportunities for entrepreneurship you know i want to support that you know you know when janelle was talking about her desire to and being a ceo and that just woke something up in me. And I remember when, you know, I was in her position and how I had crawled out of a cardboard box and saw myself going back to school and we in a PACE program at Trey Tech College and trying to figure out what was my next steps in life. And, and now sit here, you know, leading companies and being in that space and creating pathways for my brothers and sisters that are coming home. I'm overjoyed, but more importantly, uh, to see the partnership that we have here um, from the universities and the pro and, and how you have 
um, you know, Project Rebound on campus and really beginning to foster this idea of what education looks like. You should know that right now I sit on, I'm appointed by the governor uh, and I sit on the prison authority board. And one of the things that we're talking about now from the institution side is to create a real pathway when people are working in custody that they'll actually have competitive wage jobs while they're there but are tied more importantly to marketplace employment. We also are working on pieces of legislation that make the education that our brothers and sisters are acquiring while they're in custody valuable for when they come home. And I think that these are the things that you heard tonight, that we need to start treating people as human beings. We're not slaves because we made a mistake and you know, we ended up in a system and we got branded with a letter. We're not in this continual perpetual state of servitude. We wanna serve, but not serve because we're chained to it, serve because we're committed to it. We're committed to serve in a different way because, you know, that's what we're called to do is serve one another. You know, when I hear people like Chi Chi that is, have vision and hope instilled into her, and AJ, it's, 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 not, it's more than a number, right? It's a number, but it doesn't matter. Um, you know, my wife told me that life for her, you know, we met at Trade Tech together and we got married and now we're celebrating 20, over 27 years, going on 28 years. And she said life began at 40 for her. And, and so, you know, that's, it began for me too. <laughs> And so we, you know, you, you know, you, you know, life is worth fighting for and worth restoring, right? And it doesn't matter how long you, you've been out and you still need to be a part of a community, just like Cynthia said, you know, it's like I've been out for a while, but I'm a part of something and I'm something that's still teaching me and giving me back because I need a space where I can be heard and would be a space where I can be seen. You know, LARP is here for all the people. It, it doesn't belong to one person, it belongs to everybody. It's a network and it's a space where people that have been impacted and their families have been impacted, um, whether you serve one day, a hundred days, 10 years, 20 years, it doesn't matter. Whether you've been impacted because you're a family member and you need to be a part of a network and, and understanding how to navigate your loved one when they return home, that's what we exist for, is to create a space where people can be heard, where people can be seen and not invisible. Because one thing I felt when I, was, when I came back and I was on the streets that I felt like I was invisible and nobody heard me, nobody seen me and I didn't matter. And I was determined to change that um, for anybody else that would be following in my footsteps. And we're doing that now. We have a lot of work to do y'all. Um, but we're going to do it with the help of our leaders. And I'm so excited. I want to expand this partnership with you guys. You know, I, I want to continue to build upon this, this work that we're doing and tell people's stories and give a platform because it's the stories that's going to change other people's life and give people hope when they see us and when they hear us and they know that it's possible to be a part of something greater than themselves. So for me, I'm overwhelmed tonight. <laughs> I would be honest with you. Uh, I've mopped um, because, you know, you guys, yeah, you just made my work, my, my life, and my work matter. You just, you made my life matter. Everything that I've invested in, this, man, this meant something. This meant something to me tonight. I'm grateful. So powerful. And I would just like to end on that note. I'm so grateful that we shared space with you ladies. Troy, thank you um, for, you know, uh, speaking to everybody too. Thank you so much, those in the audience that attended tonight. Um, this event is recorded. It'll be up on our YouTube channel uh, for the Cal State University Library in a couple days. Um, but again, we thank you from the bottom of your heart, sharing space with these ladies 
and, and the importance of their own narrative. So have a good night and, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Bye everybody, thank you.